I recently documented my time as a contract hitman and how I was almost murdered. A request came through asking whether I could detail a perfect murder and while no murder is ideal, this one came out pretty damn close. I was seven months into my new career. My reputation as a contract hitman had begun to soar, shattering my expectations and throwing my name deep into the market. Clients were swarming in from all sides of the globe with potential hits, and I was consumed entirely by my work, so much so that I no longer counted hours but days. I was traveling so often from city to city, country to country, that days were the only thing that gave me a sense of time. It was quite euphoric. One step into the dark side of human nature, and you realize how many people are actually wanted dead, and how much others are willing to pay for the deed to be done. On the other hand, there are six sadistic clients that request you do the unthinkable to target. Torture. Most of those hold long, heavy grudges that have scratched hate deep into their hearts. The type of torture varies greatly from country to country. South America and Africa seem to prefer physical torture. Chopping fingers, prying fingernails off, or pushing rusted nails under them. Gouging eyes out, cutting tongues in half, inserting sharp, slim stakes into the ear canal, breaking toes, popping out kneecaps, skinning and tooth extractions, all just a peek into the darkness. There's also psychological torture that Russia and Germany seem to favor, but that's completely different. Toying with someone's mind and drawing out their biggest, darkest fears is arguably more effective than physical pain. Everyone has a different pain tolerance, but no one is safe from the poison the mind infects you with. You can't hide from that, no matter how hard you try. Torture pays the highest, but rarely is it something clients request. It's just too risky. Think about it. It involves too much contact between the target and the executioner. Too many chances for something to slip up or go wrong. A quick and easy job is the preferred route, both for the client as well as myself. I've only had one torture job in my three-year career, and it will be engraved in my mind till my last breath. This hit wasn't a prolonged and painful death, although it came close. Technically, I didn't cause the target any pain, unless you count the moment when I snapped his neck, but you wouldn't do that. A client contacted me via an encrypted, untraceable email one night with information on a young man he wanted dead. According to the email, the young man, Gregory, had been having an affair with the client's wife while at work. They'd sneak into a janitor closet during their lunch break three times a week and relieve the stress of work on each other's bodies. A camera caught them once the blonde woman being shown exiting the closet while hopping on one foot trying to get a high heel on. They'd sneak into a janitor closet. Gregory was shown in the film exiting after her, fixing his tie and slapping the woman's ass after closing the door. The email went on to describe how the relationship with the blonde had spiraled out of control due to their work schedules, but I skimmed through it. I didn't care for the sob story. If the client wanted someone to throw their problems on, they should have contacted a therapist, not a hitman. What I did take note of was Gregory's address, place of work, work schedule, car model, and the few pictures that had been included so I could recognize him. The last line read, Make it look like a suicide. Typical hit. Unsurprisingly, Around 40% of my jobs involve some sort of relationship hardship being the root of the problem. Backstory doesn't matter though. 30,000 would be in my pocket after the job was done and I would never look back on it. The last thing on my mind would be why I did it. It would just be another hit added to the countless others with more relevant stories behind them. 
Gregory resided in the U.S., but luckily my last job brought me back to the States after spending two weeks overseas dealing with a flurry of others that had cluttered my inbox. I was staying in a cheap motel on the West Coast, my suitcase hidden under the bed and filled to the brim with my tools and payments. I avoided reputable, fancier hotels like the Plague, places like the Marriott, the Hilton and Best Western were all sure to throw my life away. Security was just overwhelming, so I stuck to motels on the sides of the roads. I had only been at that motel for two days, and already it was time to pack my things and get a move on. Gregory lived in New York, and I was short on time if I was going to complete the job in the allotted time I guaranteed my clients, which is two days. I had two days to get to New York, find Gregory, and perform the kill. So, I asked for a favor. I called an old friend and told him I needed to fly for a job. We'd been friends for over a decade, and he happily agreed and said he was near the area. He didn't know about my career and didn't care to ask, and I paid him a hefty amount for letting me use his private jet every once in a while, so the questions were kept at minimum. I was fairly confident he was involved in drug and weapon trafficking, so it was in our mutual interest to keep our business relationship strictly business, and the jet was nice. I met him in an abandoned runway an hour later, carrying two suitcases and an iced coffee. We greeted each other with a handshake and stood on the smoldering asphalt while the pilots refueled the jet. The sun was blaring down on us and ripples of heat rose from the black pavement. Crows cawed overhead. A dead rodent lay a few feet away from us, its chest cavity open, and the contents of its stomach were spilled on the ground. I could almost hear the sizzle. Job treating you well? Landon asked, cutting the silence. The sound of a breeze echoed around us. He was wearing cargo shorts and a Hawaiian shirt that was two sizes too big for him. Dark sunglasses hid his eyes from view and blocked the sunlight. I stood well over a head higher than him and noticed his eyes darting back and forth behind me, almost as if he thought he was being watched. Yeah, very demanding, but what can you do? I answered. I sipped my coffee from a green straw and tried to read him. He nodded and scratched his thinning head. The weather was making us both sweat profusely, and we watched with growing anticipation as the jet was being prepared for takeoff. We were both eager to get inside the air-conditioned plane and have a few drinks at the bar. So, New York, huh? What takes you there? Landon continued. I eyed him carefully. It wasn't like him to start asking questions. But we hadn't seen each other in over four months, so I figured he was just trying to make polite conversation. Our days of joking about girls and complaining about teachers were over. Client wants to meet in person, I said simply. Some uptight jerk, probably. That got a chuckle out of Landon, and he relaxed his shoulders. He tended to tense up whenever he was uncomfortable a sign of his I'd picked up back when we were in high school and awkward pre-teens. But why was he so nervous? Maybe he thought I worked for the CIA because of how I was dressed and that I'd find out what he was involved in. But knowing him, he surely would have voiced his concerns. I decided it didn't matter and brushed the thought away as one of the attendants informed us the jet was ready. We both sighed with infinite relief as we entered the cabin. A nice, cold wave of air slapped us as we were walking up the steps and inside. It was refreshingly cool, and I headed straight to the bar for a drink after tossing the rest of the coffee in a trash can. The inside was well furnished and immaculate. Tan leather seats lined the windows. A beige carpet covered the floor. I sat in a tall stool by the modern bar and treated myself to some scotch, turning on the stereo system in the jet. Relaxing classical music filled the cabin. 
Landon joined me a few minutes later after being in the cockpit. He brought a pretty flight attendant with him, and suddenly the five hour long flight got much more interesting. The three of us sat in a semicircle after introducing each other and drew up stories of our childhood, memorable moments of our lives, crazy parties, past relationships, just trying to find something to make the time go by quickly. The liquor helped. I made sure to stay very vague in my stories though and omitted any important names and details about them. Drunk and tipsy, Landon and the flight attendant Christina didn't seem to notice. Landon headed to the front of the plane after an hour, saying he was going to catch up on some sleep, leaving Christina alone with me. Throughout the time we'd been there, she'd shot me playful glances and unbuttoned the top two buttons of her white shirt, blaming it on the alcohol doing silly things to her. She quickly sat next to me once a seat had been opened and stared at me in a dreamy drunken state. Her blonde locks fell carelessly over her shoulders, and her ocean blue eyes seemed distant. Her fingers formed two legs that walked up my arm. I stared at her, saddened that I would have to reject her attempt at probably the only fun she would have for the next month. It was a shame. She was exceptionally pretty, and her body was an invitation for pleasure. Her fingers intertwined as they walked up my forearm and stopped at my elbow, where they wrapped around my arm. There's a bathroom behind the bar, Christina whispered, sliding my coat off and placing it on the stool behind her. A small smile formed on her face. Her eyes fluttered from my chest to my arms, and she scooted forward on her stool and leaned in close. Her soft lips began to trace my neck, and she left little pecks of lust under my chin. She smelled of strawberries and roses, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. God, I hated myself. I slowly pulled away from her and stood up. I couldn't have any form of attachment with the path I had chosen for myself. It only led to disaster or heartbreak. Either I would get sloppy and have my past catch up with me, or I would be so busy with the hits that we would rarely see each other. It couldn't escalate more than it already had. It just wouldn't work. The look of disappointment on her face killed me, and I bent over and whispered in her ear, Work hours. I left a kiss on her cheek before smiling apologetically and headed to the front of the jet in search of Landon. I found him sprawled on a soft couch, drool dripping from his open mouth and his shirt unbuttoned. His big belly hung over the side of the cushions, and I laughed to myself before laying on the couch, opposite of him, closing my eyes. I fell into a troubled sleep. I was awoken by soft tapping on my shoulder. One of the pilots was standing over me, carrying my two suitcases and holding them up in the air. She smiled and told me we had arrived, pointing at the jet's cabin in a polite manner. I sat up groggily and rubbed my face before looking over my shoulder. Landon was near the exit, waving at me and walking down the steps and into the cold outside. I thanked the pilot for the flight and slid a bill into her palm as she handed me my belongings. She expressed her gratitude, and I let her know it was my pleasure. I wasn't going to ask, but I was sure Landon overworked his pilots and staff, and I tried to help them in any way I could. Only a few months ago I was in their shoes, struggling to make ends meet, and unsure of what the future held. I wish someone had helped me back then. I reached the back of the jet and was about to exit when someone called my name. Colson. A soft voice came from the bar. It was Christina. Draped over her arm was my coat. I didn't want to bother you since you were resting, but you wouldn't want to leave this behind now, would you? She teased. I chuckled, nodding in agreement. Thank you, Christina. 
I slid the coat on, said my goodbye as I walked down the steps. Christina waved and shut the cabin door behind me, closing us off into the outside. I hoped she'd find the present I left her once she went to clean the sofas. Landon was waiting at the bottom of the stairs. We were in an empty field. Tall grass and weeds rose up to meet my knees. Immense skyscrapers and buildings were in the background, evident of New York's busy life. The sun was setting, and the sky turned a deep orange as a chill breeze blew by. The grass swayed gracefully, and I noticed fireflies floating in the air. Well, here we are, Landon said, spreading his arms open to show me the city. New York, New York, the city that never sleeps. He spun around dramatically, and I laughed at his monologue. Thank you, Landon. You have no idea how easy you make my job sometimes. Landon brushed me away, as if his private jet was no big deal. In reality, he kept me away from customs at airports, and the ridiculous amount of effort that went into concealing weapons and chemicals for a commercial flight. I left a small token of my appreciation at the bar. I told him. Ah, oh, you know you don't have to do that, Landon said quietly. Then he laughed loudly. Ha ha ha, but you know I damn well appreciate it. We said our goodbyes, and after a quick glance back at the white jet, I made my way to the city. Two hours later, I was staying at a cheap motel near Gregory's workplace after grabbing some Chinese food and preparing my weapons. I had showered and changed and was waiting for 10 p.m. to roll around, which was around the time Gregory usually left his office. I decided to study the pictures in the encrypted email one more time, and sure enough, the office building in the photo was the same one two blocks from where I was staying. The building was a 50-foot skyscraper made mostly of glass. An ornately decorated entrance completed with a tall fountain where the concrete path that led to the glass doors split and the circle of the ceramic water structure lay open to the street. The layout of the interior was just as I suspected, having been in buildings like this one much too often. What concerned me was Gregory's transportation. The building's parking space was underground in a private parking lot and I wasn't sure where the entrance to that was. If Gregory headed there and got to his car after leaving the office, I would miss my chance. Ten minutes before I left, I gathered a suitcase filled with fake files, thick rope, and collected the tools I would be needing. A small razor, a screwdriver, a sharp knife, a syringe, and my trusted Beretta 92 with a silencer attached in case things got messy. <laughs> you could never be too careful with something like this. The syringe was filled with ketamine, an anesthetic used for light surgeries and by others as a ways to get high. The idea wasn't to render Gregory unconscious, but to put him in a trance-like state where he wouldn't be aware of his surroundings or what was occurring before I killed him. Using the needle was a risky move, yes, since it required some form of accuracy in what would be a hectic and intense situation. But Gregory was young, and the last thing I wanted was a slow-acting inhalant to ruin the plan. At 9.50 p.m., I walked out of my motel and headed to Gregory's workplace. The streets of New York were decently lit, just as Landon had said and almost looked like no one was asleep. The sidewalks were bustling with cars and pedestrians, and I was forced to slip into a dark alley in the middle of my commute. I didn't want anyone noticing me out of place, and while the detour would cost me a few extra minutes, it would outweigh the consequences of someone remembering me by chance. I've spent a good amount of time in New York, so it didn't take me long to find the correct alleys and empty streets to make it to the tall glass skyscraper. It gleamed in the moonlight. The smooth, glossy finish of glass reflected all light 
and almost making it seem like each glass panel was a different color. A few businessmen were near the entrance, all wearing expensive suits and huddled closely together, probably discussing ways to backstab a poor fellow whom they didn't like. Fortunately, they didn't seem to notice me as I crossed the street and headed back to the lot of the building. They were lost in each other's words, and I made a wide semicircle around them and cut through a small garden, another feeble attempt at adding color to the gray skyscraper. I took extra care while walking through the bushes and flowers. If a thorn or branch managed to snag even a string of fabric from my coat, links could be made, and that spelled the prison with a capital P. A few moments later, I was standing behind the 50-story building. The back lot was a rectangular parking lot that held around five cars, all parked near a rear exit. What I hadn't noticed before was that the back of the building was on an incline, adding another whole story that wasn't present at the floor. It was interesting at least. Two parking lots for a skyscraper of this size made sense, and after a quick scan of the cars I saw Gregory's a black S-Class Mercedes-Benz. That made things much simpler, and I breathed a little easier knowing that I wouldn't have to worry about him heading to the private underground lot. The red fire escape door was near the edge of the building, and plastered on it were signs that an alarm would go off if it were to be opened. I scoffed. What many people don't know is that fire escape doors are linked to building sprinkler systems and the alarm will only sound if open when the sprinklers are triggered. The plan was to enter the building and get into an elevator unnoticed, and with only two security guards roaming the interior, it wouldn't be too difficult. Once in an elevator, I would ascend to floor 25, where Gregory's office was located, and wait for him to enter an elevator and finally reveal myself where I would kindly ask him to hold the elevator doors open and step inside with him. Before the elevator reached the bottom floor, I would find an opening to inject Gregory with the ketamine, and while he was in a lucid state, carry him to his car where I would drive to his house and create the apparent suicide in his living room, at least if the scenario played out like I thought it would. With that in mind, I glided to the red door and put my ear to it, careful to hold my suitcase in a way that wouldn't juggle the contents of inside. The faint rumble of an air conditioning system and the drip drip of a leaky pipe could be heard and nothing else. My hand hovered over the doorknob, but I continued to listen, something that could only be described as my sixth sense, telling me that entering at that moment would be the wrong thing to do. What are you doing here? A voice behind the door filled with false authority and superiority loudly cut the silence. Two pairs of footsteps on the other side of the door mingled with each other before the sharp click of men's dressing shoes stopped and the dull thud of combat boots went to meet them. Keys jingled to a stop. A leather briefcase slapped against someone's leg. Oh, I didn't know anyone was back here a young man said, laughing politely. My car is right there. I think I could take a quick shortcut since the wife is waiting for dinner at home. You know women. It was the security guard's turn to laugh politely at the sexist joke. Sorry, Greg. You know I have a code of conduct to follow. Can't play favorites. I couldn't believe my luck. Gregory sighed. You're gonna make me take the long way? Frank? Sorry again, buddy, Frank said, sounding farther away than he did a few seconds ago. Take the cargo elevator, though. It's just down the hallway. I'm on the second floor anyway, so I'll stop by in a maintenance room and open it up for you. Press the M, and it will arrive on the main floor, where you can just go around the outside. Gregory sighed again and cursed Frank under his breath. Thank you, he shouted. I heard the click of shoes start again, and I quickly swung open the heavy door. Chains of plants, air was sucked in as I stepped inside, 
The hallway looked like it was still under construction and dimly lit. I quickly located Gregory to my left, standing impatiently in front of two gray elevator doors and glancing at an expensive watch. He was wearing a gray suit and a mop curly black hair lay on his head. A white light suddenly spilled into the hallway as the elevator doors slid open. Gregory mumbled something quietly and stepped inside. I made it just as the doors were about to close shut. I shot my hand behind the doors and they slowly reopened. Gregory was taken aback, not aware that there was anyone else in the hallway with him, and visibly confused. I gave him a smile as I pressed a button labeled P, which I hoped was for the private parking lot. Gregory cleared his throat and stepped away from me. Excuse me, but who are you? He asked, eyeing me suspiciously. His knuckles turned white as he gripped the handle on his black suitcase tightly. He was nervous. I chuckled, trying to lighten the mood and put him at ease, to show him I was friendly. Frank said I might be able to catch you if I ran. A stickler for the rules, that one, isn't he? Wouldn't let me go out the back door. I joked, trying to seem like it wasn't the first time I met Frank. The elevator began to descend. Yeah? Gregory answered, turning to look at the small screen above the doors that displayed a red arrow pointing downwards. Where do you work again? He asked after a pause. I'm a contract lawyer, I told him. In truth, I had no information regarding this office space or what it was for. I only knew Gregory was a lawyer, and that meant he must work for a law firm. A contract lawyer didn't have to work for the law firm he was contracted with, so that meant my sudden appearance might make sense to Gregory, but he wasn't fooled. Contract lawyers don't park in the private lot, Gregory said, and with that, he jumped forward and raised his hand to press the red alarm button, but I was aware of how he had slowly inched forward towards the elevator dashboard. I noticed how he had taken note of the floor button I pressed. I noticed how he looked at my briefcase and studied my face to see if he could remember me. But he knew he had never seen me before, and I knew he didn't believe a word that had come out of my mouth. My right arm came down in an arc to stop Gregory from sounding the alarm. My open palm slammed into his forearm, and he dropped his briefcase after he cried out in surprise. My elbow came up next, using the momentum and ramming into Gregory's chest, sending him sprawling backwards. I pinned him against the elevator wall, and, knowing he was in trouble, he tried to land a left hook on the back of my head. I read him easily and ducked in time for his arm to swing down in front of his stomach, where I grabbed it and held it in place. For a few moments we stood still, breathing hard and trying to come up with a solution. Gregory questioning how he could escape, and I was wondering how I would kill him. I barely had time to come up with something before Gregory's forehead smashed into my face, cutting open my bottom lip and throwing me off balance. The metallic, coppery taste of blood seeped into my mouth, and before I could regain my composure, Gregory pushed me to the side, quickly ran out the open elevator doors as they beeped. But I was quicker. I pushed myself off the wall and reached at the only thing I could grab, Gregory's tie. It was draped over his shoulder and fluttering in the breeze behind him, having been loosened in the scuffle. My fingers wrapped around the tie and his neck jerked backwards just as the elevator doors began to slide shut. Gregory, unaware that the elevator was seconds away from ascending again, used his arms to push against the wall of the parking lot and stop himself from being dragged back inside. The doors closed. I was left inside, still gripping Gregory's tie while the elevator rose. I heard Gregory begin to scream as the tie tightened around his neck, and began to lift him alongside the elevator. The frantic movement of his legs as they thrashed wildly could be heard through the closed doors. After a few seconds I rose above the ceiling of the parking lot and the tie shot out of my hands. Gregory's screaming turned into erratic choking noises 
as the elevator began to slow. Groaning in protest as Gregory became an anchor, being squished against the ceiling of the parking lot and preventing the elevator from reaching the main floor. The suffocating turned into a low moan as the tie broke Gregory's voice box. I heard what I thought was Gregory's hand slapping the elevator doors in a useless attempt to get them open. Suddenly, a loud snap echoed through the elevator and the tie finally ripped. The elevator then lurched upwards with a jolt. I hadn't realized I had been holding my breath the entire time. It came out slow and steady and I quickly brushed myself down as the elevator opened at the main floor. I grabbed my suitcase as I walked out, striding quickly through the ornate lobby and out the glass doors. The group of men with nice suits had disappeared. The story of a tragic accident spread through the news like wildfire. A young and promising lawyer had been found in the underground parking lot of his workplace. He had taken an elevator that was closed for renovations and thought to have malfunctioned, taking him to the lot instead of the main floor. When the man tried to exit, his tie caught on the doors as they shut and his neck was crushed as the elevator rose and pinned his head against the ceiling. His neck snapped under the immense pressure and he was found dead the next morning by a colleague. Get this, the death was ruled accidental. In internal investigation, the security guard was questioned and found guilty of involuntary manslaughter at his trial. He was to spend five years in prison. It wasn't a clean and calculated suicide as I had wanted, but things don't always go exactly to plan. I found the payment of 30000 where the encrypted email said I would, and the death was never linked to me. What more could I ask for? It was the perfect murder. The night I killed Gregory, I went back to my hotel and put everything away. I was angry at myself for letting the situation get out of hand, and most importantly, sloppy. But as I took off my coat and hung it by the door, that anger slowly faded away. I noticed a white slip of paper in the outside pocket that I had no recollection of. Curious. I grabbed it and unrolled it, smoothing out the wrinkles on the wall. Scribbled on one side was a phone number, followed by the name Christina, with the eyes dotted with hearts. <laughs>